uh-oh, we've gone and done it now. You're about to get an insider tip into your own elk hunter stock. But just like any other investment, the big question is, are you willing to go all in? The beauty of this investment is it's all reward because it's those hunters choosing not to invest that are the ones truly risking the outcome of their future hunts. So just what is the best investment? Well, y'all, just stay tuned. That topic, along with our Elk Bros shout outs and questions from our Elk Bros mailbox. So my friends, pull up a chair, adjust your volumes just right, and welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting, brought to you by ElkBros.com, with your host, Gilbert Ornelas, and elk hunting coach, Joe Gilly. You want to hunt elk? And they live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. There, everyone. If it's your first time with us, glad to have you. Hope you enjoy our show. And for those blue collar hunters following our show and grinding it out with us every week, welcome back to Elk Camp. I'm Gilbert Ornelas, the host from your show, coming to you from Spring, Texas, and your elk hunting coaches in New Mexico, in Cimarron, is Joe Gillia and none other but Leroy Chab Chavez. What's <laughs> going on, guys? And from <laughs> Katy, Texas, the leader of the Venezuelan Mafia, Luis <laughs> Gonzalez. And Joe, did I hear something out there that we may have somebody else joining us? Wait, so what do you mean the leader of the Venezuelan Mafia, man? Oh, I mean, the, oh, we, God. we're entitled to have oh, somebody God. else. <laughs> Go oh, the man. I know El Jefe is out there, <laughs> man. The Padron is here, huh? Yeah, El Jefe is out there waiting to join. Hey, Manano, welcome. Oh, brother. God. They can't. <laughs> Hey, what? Guys, we got the big cabron it's done in the I mean, house. this is it the, you know watch the ratings go completely down now <laughs> oh, oh so lord <laughs> the chief cook and bottle washer is here dude but no, no, how how long did you how much time did you spend uh you know working on your hair before the podcast <laughs> well let me tell you because i have to do an announcement I w I've been really, really busy these these days. Uh, that's why I just wanted. I just I would like to to let you know that we are having a baby. Oh, I was so busy, two. man. Number <laughs> yeah. two, the quarantine babies yeah. are popping up. Yeah. Boy. <laughs> yes. Well, Say, congratulations. Wait, 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 wait. Did he just say that we're having another baby? Yeah. Yeah. He didn't learn from the first one. So let me translate, Joe. Wait, he's wait, basically wait. saying his wife is pregnant again. What? Manano, <laughs> for all of our pregnant out too. there, for all, um, <laughs> this is uh, epic what is happening right now. Uh, if, you're, if you're just listening and you're not seeing anything, we had uh, the, the leader of the Venezuela Mafia. <laughs> <laughs> or or they can arm wrestle. One's in Dallas and one's in Katy, Texas. Uh, Manano Grateron just joined us uh, for the first time ever on our podcast. So you have the 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 Fab Five tonight, <laughs> man. I mean, we we've got all of the characters here that uh, that you guys have been hearing about. But unbeknownst to me, I mean, you heard me announce back uh, just uh, uh, some podcast ago that I just found out I was going to be a, a grandfather. Oh, and weird. now Manano comes on here and announces who, who y'all, he just had um, <laughs> our nephew that <laughs> was That's just right. born. Uh, you know, Tomas Jose <laughs> was, <laughs> <laughs> was born uh, back in August, right? Wasn't that correct? Yes. It was August. I, August. Yeah. yeah. And and now you just found out number two. Yeah. Yep. I was so busy, yo. Like I said, I was, I was so really busy, busy no with doubt. the quarantine. Real busy. Man, Joe, you ain't so, let the rest, bro. So That's, Joe, get this. Have a talk with your wife. He calls me uh, a couple of days ago and tells me the news. Right, I'm super happy, and you know, it was it was fun conversation, so on uh -huh. and so forth. And then this morning, uh, it dawned on me, and I was like, I call him back, all worried. And I was like, Manano. 
because I asked him, I was like, well, how many weeks? And she's like, oh, no, you know, she's eight weeks. And I'm like, wow, man, that's so cool. And then it dawned on me this morning. I was like, dude, eight weeks ago, you were in Venezuela, bro. <laughs> 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 the what, man. What the hell, man? Something's not, something's not right here, man. Oh, no, no, no. So I don't know. I'm just, I'm a bit concerned, but you know, we're still happy. It's just the father is the one who actually puts in the hard work. Right? Oh man. Oh my goodness. It was just after, after my arrival. <laughs> just there. Yeah, sure. Yeah. He's on the exit. Uh, but, so yeah. I, I, I tell our listeners they are in for a, a treat tonight because uh, um, we talk about it all the time and and uh, Mutt and Jeff here and the arguing. I, <laughs> honestly, God, these guys love each other like nothing Brothers, else. But yeah. uh, the first time I ever met them in camp, I was like, dude, are we going to have to separate these guys or what? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they like each other very much. <laughs> it's, a, it's a culture thing. That's the way it, we express it. It, it, it really is. Y'all have heard me say this before. My grandfather... When my dad married my mom, you know, my dad's full blood Mexican from Monterey, Mexico. And when my dad married my mom, it's customary to have the the parents from the, the bride come over and meet the groom parents and everything. And he came over and his dad and his uncle were outside getting that. I mean, they're the same way, like Manano and Luis, they were going <laughs> at it. I mean, blah, 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 back and forth and, you know, and pointing their fingers at one another. <laughs> My grandpa goes, hmm, man, they don't like each other very much. <laughs> Jeez, they come off right now, somebody talk to me like that, I'd have to whoop their ass. <laughs> I said, no, man, that's, that's how awesome, we love man. one another. My grandpa's like, oh, no, man. no, uh-uh. <laughs> well, all, all you guys listening, welcome to our elk camp, man, because – you're in it. You're dead Zip. center right now. You're enjoying it. One hundred percent. Manano, this is the first time that you've seen Chav since El Camp, isn't it? Yes, sir. And I'm so yeah, glad so. to see Chav. Good uh, to see you too. In good shape. I'm yeah, so thanks. glad for you, Chav. So Thank happy. You. Hey, Manano, how come you're not wearing the black Elbrose shirt, man? <laughs> well, because he has your picture. I don't want, I don't Precisely. Want to <laughs> uh, I don't want to wear something I knew go to close to you. Yeah, but you paid money for uh, it for sure. No, I yeah. rather I rather have a L uh, uh, L Bros and Joes and and, and Chaff. Chaff picture. Sure, you know you wear it every day. I don't want to. I don't want to. All right, guys, I'm gonna get <laughs> us rolling for these guys in here, and uh, I'm gonna do uh, I'm gonna do a little bit of housekeeping before we get there. Before we get on too much, uh, today's topic. Uh, for all you guys listening, guys, this might end up a series here, or at least two mm-hmm. parts, because there's a lot of a uh, lot of content when I started fleshing this out. So, uh, uh, like usual, we do not want to just go rushing through this. So, if it ends up being a series, it's all good. But I wanted to let you know, next week's show will be one of our, that you're going to listen to on the following Tuesday, is going to be one of our Insights Editions. That's where I get the opportunity to interview people from all walks of life about elk and elk hunting. And on next week's edition, you're in for a treat. I sit down with Paul Medell, the elk nut, and we talk for over an hour. Uh, Hard to believe, huh? Uh, If you've heard me and you've heard Paul, that's not very difficult. But we talk for over an hour. and had an incredible time. There was incredible information. In fact, Paul shares a nugget on locating vocalizations, everybody, that he tells me this. Joe, I've never said this on another podcast. And this guy's done hundreds of podcasts. And he says, I'm going to share something with you I've never, ever shared on, a, on another podcast. So he does that first time ever with me on our Insights Edition so y'all don't miss it. Uh, then Gilbert we get right back to doing our series the following week. Uh, last week, we had Dylan Ferreira on here. Uh, he's doing his thing. And uh, then today's show and then next week is going to be Paul Medell. Sounds good, man. Well, guys, y'all know what time it is. It's time <laughs> for our Elk Bros shout outs. Out. If you're shout new to our out. show, these are just shout, shout outs to the few <laughs> cities with the most listeners topping our charts this week. Yep. And we're going to start with our shout outs to those grinders out there who have been giving us incredible reviews. Remember last time I was like, what's up with the reviews, man? Show us some love, you know? Yeah, here they come. Holy Toledo, man. They started rocking coming in. So, Frankie, I wish you'd give me your last name and your, and guys, listen, you give those reviews, 
give us your your full name and where you're from so we can give your your city a shout out there so frankie fl the flatland forester the tennessee alcoholic justin gotham mm. from Maupin, oregon Alfie. that's how you do it right there justin yeah, there you go justin had it down he know how to city and state He's he's one of the edumacated out of all of us, right? Yes, so, sir. <laughs> Al feeds, and then the Zach bucks. Fisher, our brother Zach Fisher, uh, back in the house, man. So uh, I wanted to make sure I gave those, and also I want to give a huge welcome and thank you to our newest Elk Bros <laughs> patron members that I haven't been able to thank publicly yet: Paul Perky, Matt Bauer, Paul Snort. You guys, man, thank you so much for uh, helping to make this programming happen. And as well, a special thank you to those Elk Bros patron members that have now been supporting our programming for over 10 months. Hard to believe that, man. 10 That's months awesome, hard. man. You know, so uh, I, a special thank you, Larry Gill. And Larry Gill is uh, his, his close friend, and Larry believes in what we're doing. He did not draw New Mexico this year. Oh, everybody out there, the crew is in. We're in the house. Everybody for six, five, man. Six. Uh, six. We got Brandon. Brandon's the only oh, one that's uh, not here with us. And, uh, yeah. We've got all six guys are in, so uh, you guys get ready. You'll be hearing about it from New Mexico again in September. But uh, Larry Gill and it didn't happened draw. early too, Joe. It was it was early too, like a week early of the of the announcement. So what it was last it was year? Way cool. Yeah, we were coming yeah. back from hunting pigs at y'all's place when we got it on the yeah. road. So that's uh, right. Way to go for New Mexico game of fish, right? Absolutely, man. We we appreciate it. And <laughs> I, I, I wonder this year, Joe, if they didn't take a few more because of, you know, way things are and, uh, you know, through the country with the COVID and stuff like that to get some economies rolling back on their feet. I, you know, I don't know, man, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting what's going to happen with a lot of this. Cause I know some of those States that had late, um, uh, Draws. application deadlines, mm -hmm. a lot of guys didn't put in because they were worried about economic situations. So yeah. I have a feeling some of those States are going to see, you know, lower numbers as far as those guys out in the field. Also, I wanted to thank Chad Hash, and he's also been with us now for over 10 months. <clears throat> and uh, those are our, our two old timers that have been supporting our programming. I need to find some way to do something special for those guys. So yes, with sir. that said, Chad, you can get us started with our top listener spot. All right. Up first, our top listener spot is a manufacturing powerhouse. <laughs> it's home to manufacturers like the Fiat, Chrysler assembly plant, Collins Aerospace, and more. But for you sports fans, this city was one of the first places in the United States to have its own all-female baseball team. Organized in 1943, the hometown Peaches yeah. was one of only two teams that played the entire 12 years of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, <laughs> and they were also the inspiration for the movie, A League of Their Own, with Tom Hanks, Gina Davis, Madonna, and Rosie O'Donnell. So big shout out to Rockford, Illinois. Yeah. That's awesome, man. The man, Rockford Peaches. The Rockford Peaches. I yep. love that movie. There's no crying in baseball. <laughs> There's no crying. That that is. I, I bet, bro, you wore that one out, didn't you? Huh? No doubt. No doubt. <laughs> I, I, I tried to move it over to my girls in softball, but they ain't having it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so in 2016, the council of our next listening city voted to adopt the squirrel <laughs> as the city's next ma uh, city's mascot and they celebrate each year with an animal squ a squirrel fest the festival is probably nutty enough in its own right but it also features features an event called the bet race where teams push a mattress on wheels and race the city, in order to protect their mascots, have also built nutty narrow bridges, <laughs> which squirrels, uh, which are actually squirrels' uh, bridges in the city, uh -huh. treetop to treetop over roadways for the furry creatures to be able to travel overhead without having it's to squish. dodge traffic. 
Yeah, yeah. So they didn't get squished, man. Yeah, they don't get squished. They can travel <laughs> over uh, to dodge the traffic. <laughs> long, long, long view, Joe, I love Washington. You, Joe. I love you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> long view, Washington's in the house, boy. Oh. All their flat squirrels, man. <laughs> <laughs> Joe always does this to me, man. What? He just speaks the perfect words that make me just freaking squint. I don't man. know I which don't... words are going to mess you oh, up, dude. Man. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> he does. You're like that guy, Ricky freaking... Ricardo. It's going to happen one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, uh, and I wasn't laughing. I, I thought it was hilarious when he was talking about the bed race. I was going to go, hard Manano, to tell us about watching... that one. I think Manano's used that bed race. It's he? hard to concentrate watching Beto <laughs> just rolling over over there. You know, you can't read. And watch him at the same time. I'm gonna have to block I'm gonna him have next to time. Mute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's he's about to lose his juice, isn't he, man? <laughs> well, but, oh, okay, so so they they built bridges from treetop to treetop, little small bridges, so the squirrels could go across the road with without going through traffic and getting killed, man. Uh, yeah, this I is know. a town that loves their squeals. What'd you call them? What'd you call them? <laughs> <laughs> hey, dude, I can tell you this right now. They'd have never made it in my hometown because we eat. Well, I was, <laughs> was going to say, they, they, I know some other places where they would uh, they, yeah, they get served for dinner. Dinner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Up next, this top listening city is the only place in the U.S. that manufactures, and I never knew this, the Chevy Corvette. One place. Just Chevy Corvette, and it's where you can visit the National Corvette Museum. And listen to this, Grinders. We always talk about making lemons into lemonade. Well, in 2014, this town has that National Corvette Museum. The museum <laughs> experienced a devastating sinkhole directly under the museum that ended up swallowing the entire collection wow. of priceless Corvettes. <laughs> I mean, get this, oh. a sinkhole the size of, I mean, it was, it was huge. You can go to the site and check it out. Look at how big this is, right? Well, that's the lemon. <laughs> but what about the lemonade, you guys ask? Well, rather than trying to cover it up or act like it never happened and rebuilding everything, the museum staff realized that visitors were so morbidly curious about the sinkhole that rocked the car world that the museum made the whole tragedy into an exhibit. You can visit and have the entire sinkhole experience with a view into the hole, all the wrecked cars, and even you can get bonafide sinkhole dirt available in the gift shop. <laughs> so Goodness. can you believe this? And it only <gasps> happens in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Corvette wow. Central. I've seen, yeah, a, Joe, I've seen uh, a couple of them sinkholes, and they're, they're something else, man. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, Joe, uh, you know, you know, Darwin Moody, yeah, Christian right. Moody, uh, they just uh, entered uh, their Corvette and got uh, first place in their division, C2, whatever that is. They have a 1963 Corvette that got first place. Uh -huh. And I just read about that today. Oh, did you really? <laughs> so it's kind of ironic that came up. Funny. Oh, that's pretty interesting. That's, it just blows me away, man. That's crazy. Okay. And this is the first time they had to do it uh, via the internet. Wow. Usually they drive down there yeah. and get entered. And this time it was all uh, an internet uh, event. Oh, cool. Well, my cousin's that? a big car nut, Ty Lockringer. And mm -hmm. uh, he's works with many dealerships. I got to drive the first rear engine one uh, that came out. An unbelievable car, man. I mean, if you haven't driven one, you need to go drive the rear, the rear engine Corvette. It's pretty cool. Awesome, man. Yeah. All right. Up next, Joe, originally known as Campbell's Station. Our next top listener's town served as a stopping place for families, hunters, stock drivers passing through Knoxville, only 14 miles away. The town was later named after Admiral David Fargut, who was born here in 1801 and is known for his famous demand of damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. Damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead, boys. Exactly. Heck yeah. What, what most people don't know about uh, David Farga is he was the first person to ever attain the rank of an admiral wow. in the U.S. Navy. When he fought the War of 1812 aboard the USS Essex, and he was only 12 years old at the time. 
and he served as a pallbearer at President Abraham Lincoln's funeral. All of this history can be found in Farragut, Tennessee. Farragut, Tennessee. Tennessee mm. guys and gals in the house, man. Thank you for listening. And I tell you, you what, y'all, y'all people are serious in Tennessee, man. You sent a boy out there to fight a war at age 12. 12 Ooh. years old. <laughs> mm-hmm. Volunteer. <laughs> Volunteer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah. You wonder how, I don't know, man. That, uh, you know, I, I always heard about our uncles and stuff like that. People lying about their age so they could go fight in the war, you know? Well, I wonder how old he was when he became an admiral. You know, I mean, he said he fought a war in 1812 aboard the USS uh, Essex, and he was only 12. I I, mean, was he an admiral then? I'll give you, I, I, no, he wasn't. He wasn't. No, that happened way later. But I'll give you another thing most people didn't know about him was he was actually a Southerner that was an admiral for the Union Navy. And uh, uh, so for him to become an admiral was really special because a lot of people didn't trust him because he was a Southerner. And yet he was responsible for some some of the biggest victories that happened during that war. So, Nano, this is it, bro. I get the first time up, man. Let's go for it. (laughs) So our next city was once known as the jewelry capital of the world for its many jewelry manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the territory it occupies today was first settled in 1634, only 13 years after the pilgrims landed in Plymouth, oh. and was incorporated in 1694. The city has a lovely riverfront park, a thriving zoo with more than 100 animals, a famous art museum, and the unique woman at work museum. But for all our archers out there, if you're ever in the area, you can always go to Expot Archery and get your shot on with 14 shooting lanes and bows to rent. Awesome. There we go. What's Where is it at, bro? Massachusetts. Well, what town in Massachusetts? <laughs> Adler, Adlerboro. Okay, so yeah, good, well, good job, dude. Attleboro, man, Attleboro, Massachusetts, man. <laughs> Attleboro, Attleboro. Yeah, hey, man, it, man, it has, too many, guys, it has too many T's and, 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 and L's <laughs> to pronounce it well. Yeah, know, what the heck is up with them? What the heck is up with them glasses, dude? <laughs> man, I'm blind. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> I read too, too much. much time man, when I, when I saw him, I was like, dude, that's my goo. We're going to call him my goo. I got to use it. What? I got to use it. Mr. Uh, I, don't need it. I don't need it to, to, to go out and, and shoot a nail. So, that's right. So, you don't need it. So yeah. the first time um, the first time that Manano said uh, Attleboro, he said uh, uh, Attleboro. Yeah, and, man, it's good. And I, and I was like, bro, man, you got to do this like a white guy, man. It's Attleboro. <laughs> Attleboro, man. So, <laughs> don't listen to them, dude. You did it just fine. Oh, he killed yeah, it. No, man. he did good. Heck yeah. Hey, I mean, Clement, Clement, and I did for Clement sure. Clement is hard. Oh, yeah, and, and look, man, Luis nailed the squirrels. <laughs> squirrels. I can't freaking pronounce it. I got word, news dude. for you. Yeah. The dude, I saw that and I went, Joe is so bad. <laughs> he is. He <laughs> is. He does it on purpose, too. And then, he, like, and then he plays. He Dallas, plays. Dallas, Texas. Okay, cool. <laughs> he plays tennis and he's like, I don't yeah, know what yeah, word yeah. you don't <laughs> pronounce. <laughs> oh, I didn't do that. <laughs> I mean, I figure, You're man. I mean, you me. guys, I figured you've seen a squirrel or two, man. So, I, mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know you've made a squirrel squeal, but you know. <laughs> uh, so let's get into it. And, and guys, we appreciate you guys listening to our, our circus. We don't know how many times we'll ever have all five of us together, um, but we. I really wanted uh, all of us together uh, this time, especially talking about this topic tonight, uh, and. You know, you're getting a special insight into just who we are, and and we have fun together. We razz each other, and we have a good time. And our out camp is just so much fun. So we're basically yeah. taking along with us, just like you're with us, huh, guys? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure, Joe. I, I would harken back to if you guys haven't had an opportunity to listen to our podcast from Elk Camp, 
go back in the archives and dial that up. That's priceless elk hunting information. And you get to see the full Venezuelan mafia and the Pennsylvania cat killer himself, Brendan Houlihan, yep. uh, who will be with us this year again in New Mexico. But you'll get to hear it all straight out of the cat's mouth up there yep. uh, on the mountain. I mean, it's one of my, the coolest, uh, the really coolest podcast we've ever shot is on the mountain. Yeah, yeah we actually two or three episodes came out of uh, yeah, uh, I think three Elk episodes. Camp we did three year. episodes out of it. And then also we have another uh, podcast where we were all together in uh, South Texas. Yes, yeah, we had to shoot that one twice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> like forty five. Joe, at one o'clock in the morning, Joe looks at me and goes. I forgot to hit record. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, no, nah, you're just messing with us. And he's yeah, like, no, no he wasn't. <laughs> I, ha I have been known to make mistakes. <laughs> Me too. I forget. My cousin shoots a 411 bull and I, I double click on the record button and uh, it's not recording. Uh, right? I, kill, I see the bull fall over, but I don't get the shot. The kill and shot you know that you guys were so cool about that too. Cause man, that first time around was awesome. man. we were like yeah. almost to the oh. end. And I no look doubt. at him and I go, oh, crap, do I tell them? Do I act like we have it anyway and just say something happened? <laughs> I'm like, uh, uh, guys, um, and I mean, and Luis was rolling. He was like rocking. He was going, man. And I was like, oh, Luis, wait, wait. Uh, <laughs> I, thought I thought Kim McCorkle was going to die because he's over there gorking anyway, about ready to fall asleep. Right? Yeah. I mean, that boy goes to bed at like eight o'clock. So oh, my goodness. The, yeah. the day is like one o'clock and he's barely yeah, he hanging was on. dying. Yeah. We had to get him another awesome 10 to bands. Ken there. It, it yeah. was, man. Yeah. It, it really was. was. All right, guys. So, uh, our topic tonight, and we're going to get into the meat of it for you, is an elk hunter's best investment for success. And, and I'm going to start this out because I, I want all you guys to think about this. When, when we talk about the investment, we're going to talk about in the best thing for you to really focus on for this next year. And, and when I put this, it, I want you to think about something because it doesn't matter whether for this for part, whether it's archery or rifle hunting, because uh, some things will apply, some things won't just because of the nature of the hunt. But I want you to think about this. What percentage of guys this season are going to be using a weapon out when they're hunting elk? <laughs> whether it's rifle or bow, how, what percentage of guys, if they're hunting, are going to have a weapon? 100. 100, right? 100. percent How many during the archer season are most likely to be wearing camo? 100 percent. Probably 100 percent. 99.8, 99.7, maybe. Right? Okay. At least how many do you think hat. of those guys out there archery hunting are going to have an elk call with them? Right. Uh, yep. Almost everybody. Maybe 90 percent. Maybe 95 percent. Maybe Manano. Yeah, yeah, we don't know. <laughs> I'm practicing though. <laughs> how, <laughs> how many of those guys are going to be wearing footwear or are going to be using arrows and broadheads or they're going to have a range finder if they shoot pins or they're going to have a wind indicator? The point I'm trying to make, y'all, is everybody, right? This year alone, thousands of dollars are going to be invested in preparation for the upcoming season and it's going to be spent on things that make us feel good you know i know guys gals everybody wants to get something new wants to get a piece of equipment they want to get gear they want to get i mean uh that latest and greatest right but i want you to think about that a hundred almost a hundred percent of everybody out hunting this year is going to have the same pretty much type of gear they're going to be in camo going to have their bow going to have their boots going to have all that stuff what's going to be the percentage of the success rate Man, it just Dang. yeah. Well, going ten percent. What's no, going to be the, the what's going to be the success? Ten, five, five to ten percent. That's what right? I've, I've I've heard or seen on the statistics. Is usually no matter how much gear you got, five yeah. to ten percent. Yeah, no matter, and and that's with everybody going in the woods, a hundred percent the same, and only five to ten percent of those people are going to be successful this year, right? Okay, so. The point being is it's not gear that differentiates one hunter from the other when it comes to success, right? Amen. Yeah, let's look at what we all have here, and let's look at what we all don't have. And the point that mm -hmm. I'm trying to make is so many people are going to try to get ready for this upcoming season and think that what's going to make them successful is going to be a piece of gear. And I want to tell you guys, it is not. 
Do the math. You hear me say, oh, gosh, I think sometimes I should have been a math teacher. Do the math, right? <laughs> it, it's, that's not going to be what's going to do it, right? Yeah, it can make things easier, but it, it's not going to seal the deal. It, it's our equipment, right? Yeah. It, it's, yeah. it's our tools that we have, right? But you take, why is it that you take um, cooks, for example, take gardeners, for example. Everybody can have the same tools, but some cooks are chefs and some people ain't that good at it. And some people are incredible gardeners when other people with the same tools ain't getting it done, right? Yeah. So if we all have the same tools, why, what is the difference? And I'm going to tell you what the difference is. Here you go. It's because you got to invest in the most important <clears throat> tool, the most important item, y'all, and that's yourself. 100%. Yeah, you, you've you got to invest in its knowledge, its know-how, its confidence, its attitude and mental strength, its work ethic. If you are not investing in yourself, I'm telling you, that is the difference. That is why one out of 10 guys is being successful because of those items that I just told you, their knowledge, their know-how, their confidence. Yeah. Joe, it, it, it makes perfect sense, right? I mean, uh, if you think about what makes a hunt successful, it's, you know, two things combined. One is having the opportunity and two, sealing the deal. But for those two things, you have to be prepared to, to get an opportunity. You have to, you have to know you have to have the know-how, the, the knowledge of the animal, understanding uh, uh, the situations and being in good shape. You have to create the opportunities. And for that, there is a lot of work that goes behind it. And then also to seal the deal, that second portion of it, you have to invest time in practicing with the equipment that you're going to be taking with you. Absolutely. Take time Absolutely. In, in making in sure that you know, everything. yeah, it, that you understand your equipment, that your equipment works for you, that you are capable of actually placing the shot where you're putting that, that eye and where you want it to go. So uh, 100%, man, this yeah. is uh, And definitely. what you're talking about there, you're talking about knowledge, you're talking about know-how, you're talking yeah. about work ethic, you're talking about putting the time in. And, mm -hmm. and so the whole point of this show, this series, is to get across to guys and gals out there that it is not, you, you are not able to depend on a piece of equipment to make your hunt successful. It you, it's you, your knowledge as a hunter, your ability as a hunter, your confidence, your attitude, your work ethic. It's those things that are going to determine your success at the end of the day, it's especially consistent success, mm -hmm. consistent success, because there's always going to look, I, I talk to guys. Blind hog time. can find an acre every <clears> now yeah, and then. Heck yeah. We are notorious people for spending a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars on a new bow, but how much time, energy, and money do we spend on improving ourselves as making ourselves a better weapon, making ourselves the better hunter, you know, learning that knowledge out there, taking the time, you know, and I think that is the number one thing that I hear from somebody. And I'll tell you, that's the worst thing to invest in. I, I brought this up. I think I, I, I told Gilbert about it. And uh, I think I told Manano that the worst piece of equipment that guys and gals can invest in is a round to it. You know what a round to it is? I don't. Oh, get around to it, yeah. <laughs> well, well, get around to it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I'll get around I'll to it, it man. Later. I'll yeah. do it later. Yeah. Procrastination is the assassination yeah. <laughs> of, of a lot of dreams. Look, I, I have Paul Medell on the show next week. Paul Medell has an app, the Elk Nut app, <clears throat> that when I bought it at the years ago, when I first saw it, it was around $5. And uh, guys out there, I think it's like $10 right now. And I recommend this. Look, I've been, I've been talking to elk for years and years and years. 
And before I started doing this podcast stuff, I never had names for stuff. It, it was just language that we spoke. I mean, you didn't put a word to it. It's just what we did. And now that I hear how everybody already has these names, we start to match up what we're doing and stuff like that. But he has this app, dude, that people can go to and learn how to communicate with elk. And it costs $10. And that $10 investment is, it's going, it's, 100 times worth more than that if it's going to put you in a situation to get more opportunities and be able to close the deal like Luis is talking about, right? Mm -hmm. But I can tell you how many guys that will get that app and what they're going to do is on their drive out to Wyoming, on their drive out to Montana, on their drive out to New Mexico, they're going to start listening to it. (laughs) Too late. You follow me, right? Yeah. Yeah. They got around to it. They got late. around to it, man. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and everybody says, well, my, my life is too busy. But I guarantee you how many hours and stuff will people spend on the Internet doing research on their bow or on their broadheads or on their arrows and stuff like that to get that stuff bought, to get that together, just to shop at it and look at it. And, and we're kind of preaching to the choir a little bit here because the people that are listening to this podcast are people trying to better themselves, right? Grinders. Yeah. Yeah. These are the grinders trying to better themselves. So uh, I, I, but at the same time, all of us, myself included, we fall short in a lot of ways. Okay. So, what we're going to do now in, in this show is we're going to break down those areas to invest your focus, time, energy, and money. And the first area that I want all of us to talk about is elk hunting knowledge. So, Manano, you know, earlier when I talked about elk hunting knowledge, I was talking about calls and uh-huh. calling and stuff like that. And, and you brought up being somebody that was new as a basically mm-hmm. a new elk hunter, not a new hunter, how that knowledge was something that really kind of hit you in the face when we were hunting. Oh yeah, of course. Because, uh, uh, I was born in, in Venezuela and, uh, and, and I, I grew up hunting as a rifle hunter and the main rule for, uh, for a successful hunter, at least down there, it's just to be quiet and not don't make any noise and <laughs> and you know get behind Buddy, I got the tree. For you. It's no different for you than it is whitetail hunters in the east. So good point. That's right. That's right. Yeah, in 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 the very first time that we uh, that I I I, I, I hunt uh, uh, in New Mexico with yo and you guys, uh, one of the main. Uh, um, you know, a point that I I remember every every time that I go out, it's make an opportunity, make a a, a, a clean uh, space to to get a, a good shot. Make and, sure that you have a good clear shot. So get, yeah. you've got to clear and yourself I, for the opportunity. And I said actually because I argue with everybody all the time. I argue with Joe that that time, and I say Joe, the elk is gonna see me. And he said, <laughs> "I don't want to say this exact word he mentioned, but he said, forget it. Yeah. Stay there, wait for me, and you know, create the opportunity. Because if yeah. you are behind the tree, you won't be able either. Yeah. I mean, you you won't be able to make a shot. And and that's one of the uh, you know the the yeah, that not don't ones. worry about making noise. The elk's making noise yeah, when it's coming. Absolutely. And yeah. I think the it, that was the first day, and after the third or fourth day, I had an incredible opportunity with an elk within five yards, but I was behind a little pine. And you smell like perfume. <laughs> <laughs> Brute by Fabergé. <laughs> yeah. And Manano, if, if, if as a rifle hunter you were raised to be silent, how come you take shower curtain camo to, uh, to go hunting <laughs> with you all the time? Here we oh. go. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> don't, 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 don't go that route. Because I got a good example of what uh, Joe was saying. Because... For example, when you when you purchase a really sophisticated grill for your house, you try to to emulate my my grilling, you know, my skills. <laughs> you won't be able to make it, man. 
<laughs> Even if you There's if no you doubt. buy a, a ten thousand dollars drill, you won't be able to make picanha. I don't. I don't. You, you, you I don't have to have to the either. knowledge. <laughs> have to invest right. in knowledge. <laughs> I don't, and I don't want it's, to it's, either. Hey, it's all about the knowledge. It's the it's the knowledge it's keeper, all, right? Yeah, that's actually a, that's actually a great segue and example for it. You know, it doesn't yeah. matter how good of a grill you have. You guys have seen what Manano's capable of doing with the picanhas out of camp, with just a little. <laughs> Yeah, you know, a charcoal. couple of rocks and a little, yeah. you know, charcoal mm. and stuff like that. So, yes. oh yeah, it's just last day of last day of listen, the camp. Listen, because you won't, you you won't hear again. You <laughs> won't hear again. Never in life. Now. I can admit that. Huh? <laughs> I'm trying. To, I'm trying to keep, you know, stay polite yeah. during the yeah. podcast. Well, Manano. we have it on video, man. We we we, yeah. we heard Luis say that uh, Manano was the <laughs> was it the best cook or. Uh, I, mean, yeah, I wouldn't go that far, no. Joe. <laughs> go that far. He's well, pretty dang dang man. <laughs> so, I'm telling you what, he's pretty dang good. Yeah, he so, is. You know, when we're Ain't when it. we're talking about hunting knowledge, I, I think, you know, I think Manano could have gathered a lot of this up in in a lot of ways, and Luis could have gathered up in a lot of ways. But their first experience ever with elk hunting was with us, and and they knew that they were going to have somebody. They basically found a mentor and that's one thing that we want to tell people out there is is that the best thing that you can do and it doesn't even have to be somebody uh, in your same town doesn't mean your same city same mm. state man there's people that will mentor you and talk about things and have conversations i i have called on the phone and you can ask a lot of these guys that send letters into me um i call them up and we'll have conversations and i've mentored a, a lot of hunters out there that were just looking for information on elk hunting mm -hmm. knowledge and it it always amazes me the things that we kind of forget that we take for granted that other guys are like i never thought about that man i, I never even thought about that yeah, for instance, Joe, I had a guy email me just a couple of days ago and he said, look, I heard you talk about your boots on the podcast that soul's falling off and I have a pair of those boots, you know, right. he said, what do I need to be looking for? And I'm like, look, I don't, you know, I've wore those boots for two or three years and I don't know what happened. He wanted to know if I used some stuff to clean them with that he'd heard that could dissolve the glue. And I'm like, no, man, those boots don't see anything. They go in, you know, they go in my backpack. And when I come home, I put them on the shelf They hadn't seen anything, you know? So he said, well, what kind of boots are you wearing now? And uh, I told him, you know, he said, could you send me a picture of them? I'd like to buy the same pair of boots because sounds like we're about the same size guy and I want something real comfortable. I'm not real comfortable with the ones I'm wearing. So, I mean, look, I have no problem. You know, I mean, we ran into that in the woods. Guys yeah. were like, oh, my God, look at your pack. Oh, my God, look at your boots. You do wear those. I'm like, yeah, for sure. I mean, oh, absolutely, man. We're not lying. I mean, I've, I've tried a lot of other things, but you know, for me, my feet are the most important thing for me because that's what's taking me from A to B. The smartest thing I ever did uh, as, a, as a young man in my career as a coach was I, I found the best mentor I could find in my life. And that, was, that yeah. was Chav. And uh, it's funny, we, we kind of switched roles when it came to hunting like that. And, uh, and so I, I'm telling guys out there, look, if, if you want to go the guide route, and and you want to pay for a guide that uh, is is going to help you out. Be very very careful in doing that because uh, it it's, it can be a good thing, but you got to have a conversation. You got to communicate ahead of time and find out if this is a teaching guide or if this is a point and shoot yeah. guide. If it's yeah, somebody manage that, expectations. Yeah, you got to have those expectation sets. If it's somebody that's going to help you and kind of tell you about things as you're as you're going, and you let people know that basically you're paying to learn about elk hunting from your guide that that yep. that is what your money's for uh yeah and and that's how i got started that's how you got started man Did. and wanted a 40th birthday present to go on a real elk hunt yeah Whew. changed and, my life forever and so make sure that you do that so that you know find that mentor find somebody to guide you find an instructor or guys that's what we're here for we are your elk hunting coaches uh and so you want to do that i I tell people too, there is so much free information on the internet. There is no reason 
you are not able to flatten out that curve just by doing that same research and putting that work in there, listening to podcasts like this, going on blogs and websites. There's so much information out there. And I think some guys are like, well, but I hear this and I hear that. What you look for is you look for cross-referencing. Man, when you when you listen to multiple um experts out there and they start talking about things and some of that they're going to have different styles mm. but when some of that information starts to cross uh, across each other man that's that's that cross reference cross referencing that that targets you in on something that you better be focusing on you know i i i've heard so many people that have that have said that they hate to hunt pressured areas and what what i've told them is it depends on the time of the day that you're hunting it and when that pressure is because if you go out and night bugle and and you hear a bull bugle uh down in a, in a basin i guarantee you that's not another hunter now you're keyed in yeah. you're keyed in that's a nugget man right there and uh go listen to uh, um Michael Batiste go listen to I just got to talk Paul does the same thing uh go listen to any of these guys that are putting in that extra work and that extra effort to make sure that they're on elk when most people are just getting up out of bed or they're already in bed so yeah it's a lot of work but man it's only a lot of work for 7 to 10 days that you got to put it out there um I the, the other thing is like I said if there's a nap, I, I tell you what, y'all, if I have nothing, <laughs> we are building our own elk hunting academy, right? And people ask me, so why are you telling us to go listen to Paul Medell and stuff like that? And I'm like, because he has earned that right. Because yeah. as a coach, I want all of our athletes, all of our hunters to have the best resources available to be the best hunter they can be. And that app is an incredible resource. If you don't go look for it, you don't go uh, put that in your toolbox. Uh, like my wife tells me, oh, shame on you. <laughs> she tells yeah. me, shame on you, man. And uh, uh, I, I think it's incredible. There's courses out there. Corey Jacobson it has an incredible course. You know, go do that. Trainings, webinars, and seminars. And uh, knowledge, y'all, is your your most valuable weapon. That is something yeah. that is going to help you get in the position that you need to be in, determine what you need to do once you're there, and then finish it at that time. And, and then be responsible and take care of the meat. So... Uh, Joe, and I think it does make a huge difference uh, in in a lot of ways. Even though if you don't get to practice those knowledges all the time, right. uh, I, I do recall a couple of podcasts ago. Uh, I think we got some feedback from one of the listeners, one of our grinders, saying, "I was like, man, I could hear, I could hear Gilbert's voice and Joe's voice and Chaff's voice when I was out there, you know." And it's like, right. and and that's what happens, right? I mean, you listen to things, you watch things, and just when you're out there and that that knowledge hits you know the situation hits a trigger that voice comes up that knowledge comes up and you start applying it you know yeah it would be ideal to be able to start applying those things uh, as much as you can when you go out there and and, and take your time and practice but um even if you don't you know just those resources are extremely valuable so let me ask you guys, what are what are some of the ways that you guys try to, uh, anything different than what we've talked about right now, uh, that you try to improve your elk knowledge, your elk hunting knowledge? So I, I can tell you that I've, I've gone to a couple of different sources, right? I mean, one was the uh, Elk 101, you recommend it, right? Mm -hmm. um, then I also, with regards to the calling, I went in online and, um, uh, you know, I started recording the different the different uh calls and right. label them and i have them on my phone as a shortcut so i have my diaphragm in my vehicle and uh you know obviously i listen to our podcast all the time even if i'm part of it uh mm -hmm. you know i i still pick up stuff from you guys that you know i didn't pick up the first time around you know i was um having a conversation with uh uh mr amp <laughs> uh baker and uh, he, he uh, on Instagram and he is saying, hey, you know, it's like it's, it's a lot of content. You know, I said, man, it's hard for me to keep up with the guys. You know, I take notes sometimes right. uh, during the podcast because it's, it's valuable stuff. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's what I do. And then I try to apply as much as possible when I go public land hunting for pigs. Right. I mean, yeah, it's not the exact same type of hunt, but it sure 
puts me pretty close to similar situations. People don't understand how how elusive the the American feral pig is oh. and how hard they are to hunt. I mean, they're tremendously tough, smart little critters that if you, you know, man, I'm telling you, you sneak in on a pack of hogs, it's, it, you know, I'm not saying it's as easy as doing it with elk, but I'm telling you, it can really help your woodsmanship, which is, I'm telling you, one of the key things to getting the deal closed when you get in a real tough environment. Absolutely. I agree. And I, I've actually had guys that, uh, in fact, we have one of our questions uh, from Elk Bros mailbox from Mike Wilson out of Ogden, Utah. And uh, uh, he, he had a, a question about, you know, um, now that he started listening to our podcast, he's kind of really into podcasts. He said, but y'all only come out every Tuesday. He said, what do I do with the rest of the week? So he said, Could, <laughs> can you point us in the right direction? And mm -hmm. and I listen, guys out there. Um, I, Michael Batiste used to do a Wapiti Wednesday with um, uh, uh, Western Contours and Guy, and Guy is tremendous. Uh, he really has great podcasts, and anything that has Michael Batiste on there is going to be a is is going to be fantastic. And uh, he's a great guy. He's a passionate elk hunter. And what you're going to find is all of us have a lot of similarities and some differences in some ways and means, but that's all good. That's just because yeah. we have different mm -hmm. styles. We're different, different styles. personalities, you know, but uh, if I were you, I would look for other podcasts that have the following guests. Uh, Paul Medell, which you've already heard me talk about. Chris Rowe. You know, Chris is incredible yeah. when it comes to elk knowledge. Oh. Elk knowledge. Oh, yeah. He's it's very technical. Very technical. And there's a lot of information, but and it's not for everybody. It's not for everybody, but if you really want to learn the animal and you want to, if you want to think about things and to see how things work out, um, if you listen to him and then listen to ourselves and then you listen to Paul, you listen to Michael, uh, listen to Corey Jacobson, listen to Randy Newberg, um, you're going to start hearing some of the same things because these are the same concepts. And, and then you it, start building your own style too, Joe, because yes. I mean, I, yeah, you know, it's not, I, I think, I think it helps you kind of gather what you feel that are the things that are working for you because every hunt has, has a different style too, different situations. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, not everybody hunts the way we do. Right. Sure. And, and not everything we say here applies for everybody. Right. And so, I mean, you know, being able to have that diversity and, and knowledge absolutely helps build your, you know, your ideal case. Well, in our environment, you know, our environment here in New Mexico is different from what, uh, exactly. from, from what Paul and Corey are going to deal with up in Idaho. Um, it's different from what, uh, Trent and Cody are going to deal with born and raised over there in Oregon. Uh, it's, it's different from what guys are going to deal with in Montana, Wyoming, Utah, our environment is different. So we hunt it with what works in our environment. You know, I, I talk about how I like to be on my knees and take a shot, right? Well, that's because of the nature of where we hunt and what it is. But try doing that in Oregon. Mm. Or yeah, try, Texas. <laughs> yeah, try to shoot. You saw us show us that video a minute ago. Try to shoot from your knees there. Yeah. Yeah. You wouldn't even see the animal. No, yeah. I mean, it, it's impossible. It's so thick. It's a jungle there, yeah. right? So, I mean, you have to adapt to your situation. But I tell you guys, if you want to listen to podcasts, go listen to Elk Talk um, with uh, Randy Newberg and Corey Jacobson. And, yeah. and, and Corey style and, and Trent style from Born and Raised, those guys are run gunners, man. I mean, they're, yeah. they're going to cover country. They're going to scream challenges. They're going to put out locations. They're going to find that bull that wants to play and and that's all they're looking for well mm. when when you're tied to the amount of acreage within a unit we are which is different you know i found out today if you buy an otc tag and i never realized this i've guided in colorado but it's always been on land you know uh private land and stuff i've never hunted it otc like we tell everybody i've never hunted out in new mexico for elk everything's always you know all 34 of those critters have been taken on public land <laughs> drawn for here in new mexico but if you get an otc tag in colorado you know you can hunt any otc unit I mean, oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. So you could be in unit 46 
and you don't you don't hit any animals in that. You, you shoot, you can drive another fifty miles and oh, try another cool. unit if you want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, that changes your style there. That gives you so much more country to find a bull that just wants to play. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, it, another thing, Joe, I think it's important is like, look, you know, we all have different uh, styles in which we, it, it's easier for us to absorb information and learn, Absolutely. you know, and, and so totally. that's why it's also important for you to kind of, you know, just go out there and, and seek out as much information as possible. It, it, an example you gave Chris Rowe, right. I mean, right. like I said, incredibly technical guy. I mean, for me to, watch him show a graph you know that's the way my brain works i mean right. i have to look at the graph and look how the pitches go up and down and stuff like that and just kind of put that in the background with the actual behavior of an elk in the back i was like oh that's what that means you know putting right. one you know two and two together and i was like oh okay that's how and then just being able to record my own videos to have them in my phone so i can just kind of play them as like get that pitch so I can, I'm able to replicate. I mean, everybody's different, but that worked for me. Right. And, and obviously, you know, tagging along with you and, and being able to watch you do your magic. It's just, you know, I think obviously, that's unbelievably <laughs> valuable, right. Yeah. Being able to hunt with guys that are better, like he said, finding a mentor. Mm -hmm. It's, that's huge. You but know? you know, Chad's been with me. This will be our 39th season that we've been hunting together. And, uh, but yet he's on his own journey now to learn how, because he never had to call elk. He always had me calling the elk in the past, right? Or he hunted mm -hmm. on his own. He just used his woodsmanship or he used a hoochie mama or something like that. But like, Bud, you're going through that journey right now. Uh, and you're trying to find ways to help yourself as far as learning how to call elk, you know, that kind of knowledge. What do you do to help yourself with that? Well, uh, I get on the internet and uh, uh, listen to different people, different people's technique. And, uh, you know, just going back a little bit before uh, on, the, on the previous topic, a lot of times the terminology will vary from region to region. So when somebody says something in a particular podcast right. and somebody says the exact same thing, but in different uh, terms, uh, that's why it's important to listen to a variety of podcasts because uh, even though you may know a lot about what, uh, you know, about calling or techniques in, in hunting, uh, it's the way it's presented, you know, right. different people will, will, oh, that's what he meant by that. I didn't know that. It's just the, the technical terms. But going right. to the calling, uh, I got out there uh, two days ago. <laughs> in my daughter's backyard and started uh, calling and I had every dog in the neighborhood howling out. I told you. My neighbors hate me. But I know it's going to take practice. So, you know, uh, you know, being laid up here other than. Uh, we shame like Louise and have all the cats. No fall. cats, Jeff. No cats. <laughs> no cats is dogs. Come on, man. You had the dogs, man. <laughs> Well, it's a but, but, it's a but let me tell you, Chav, that is not a bad result because my dog, when the elk start bugling back in the back, mm, goes nuts one. in the backyard with that. So uh, mm. if, if you didn't have any cats come in or <laughs> that's a pretty good result. And, and we can pick on somebody here because when we talk about elk hunting knowledge here, uh, we, we have somebody in, that's an incredible hunter, has a lot of knowledge there. And let's see, let's see, uh, Chav's working on his calling, Gilbert, incredible oh caller. Uh, Luis is, man, Luis is making it happen. And oh, am I missing somebody? Huh? <laughs> I'm practicing, yo. <laughs> hey, I've been really busy. Uh oh, <laughs> yeah. to get around to it, huh? Yeah. To, we, yeah. had to, we had I'll to tell Manano no, where the I'm diaphragm practicing. went. Practicing. Well, we know he's busy, man. He's already like it's 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 not even two years. He's got two kids, man. I mean, yeah. it's like <laughs> <I'm> really busy. <laughs> you know, maybe you ought to spend more time with the calling, Manano, man. So. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, I could have run with that. <laughs> oh, I know, man. Oh. That's going to be an edit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, you know, and, and, and to bring that back around when we're talking about elk hunting knowledge, I, I'm going to give you another, another point 
that that people uh, and that's probably where we'll probably head off into our, our mailbox after this but you know there's so many opportunities to get yourself in the elk with sometimes we don't take advantage of and it's called family vacation sometimes man mm -hmm. and you know uh <sighs> Plan it to be in the mountains sometime. And let me tell you what the benefit is that not only do you get out there and you can work on your woodsmanship, but you can spend time with your kids teaching them that. You can share your passion with your uh, husband or your wife and share how much you love to hunt those animals out there. Share that world with them. Explore that world with them. And at that time, you're, you're doing some things going to help you on a lot of different fronts. It's going to help you with that knowledge. You're going to actually be able to maybe see one, smell one, see the track from one, you know, uh, get some things to ask questions so that when you are actually have you know, boots on the ground there. Now, when you come back, you, it gives you a whole different way to ask questions because you have something to relate to. So. Yeah. And you're going to know how you feel at altitude too. And I can't exactly. tell you what that makes a difference. I, there's everybody that comes to camp uh, every year feels that big, huge monkey in the middle of their back. Right. Right away. It's it, right away. I mean, when, when uh, Brendan showed up to camp last year, he was like, dude, I just can't get this thing off my back for a couple of days. He I'm had like, a headache for a few yeah, days. Yeah. yeah, he did. And yep. it happens to everybody that everybody, comes up yeah. to altitude. Sure, it does, there, There's also another another point to what you're saying, Joe. You go out there with your family and then you, you rig up camp, you right. know, and then you realize where your failures are. What are the things that you need? You know, what are, you know what's working and what's not? And, and that makes a big difference. I mean... Perfect example. Manano spent about a whole day just trying to rig up his camp uh, last year, and uh, I have it all on film, and uh, it was pretty embarrassing. Time actually. lapse. So yeah, it's. Uh, oh my God. Yeah, I mean, we all had to help him, you know, and so uh, I just wanted to make that, that and offer of things to help. Yeah, that's like, right. You had to. How many things did you have on your list that he didn't have? Oh yeah, well it's not go there. But, but oh to, to Manano's credit, I think oh he's God. I think he's been hunting elk for three years, and he's two out of three. So, uh, yeah. hey, you know, with help, yeah, with help for sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's like, because like, he, he spent like less say, time. Yo, it but I call an elk for him, it. and he missed it, and he hasn't called an elk for me yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't matter what Manano. It doesn't matter if you have the newest bow or not. I mean, it, it's like golf. If you uh, hit the ball badly or whatever, it right. only counts what appears on the on the card. That's right. And Hogan was shooting in the '60s with cherry wood and a <laughs> yeah. and a, a daggum, you know, old bladed iron. He did not have to have all the new stuff. So Hogan yeah. was the man. Well, you know, but 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 being really honest, I rather have uh, the newest ball. Uh, I mean, against Luis. I don't care if he, <laughs> I, I, I would have always the best stuff. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to yeah, go let's... back. And I, I just want to add one point before we go to our mailbox is that when talking about webinars, seminars, and trainings, look, I was mentored by what I, who I think is, was the best track coach uh, in the country. Uh, that's how I felt about that. And then we went and mo won multiple state championship after state championship. But every year I went to every coach's clinic I could ever get to. Uh, because I'll tell you this, there's two things that happen when you go to these seminars or these workshops or these trainings is that either information that you have gathered up yourself gets reaffirmed or it gets labeled for you so that it kind of puts some pieces together for you or you're going to pick up a nugget if you pick up one thing that can make a difference in what you're doing out in the field it's a success so one thing that Great. as a professional coach we never missed any kind of training we could get to and for you to be a successful hunter 
get to any kind of training that you can get to for that. If you get a chance to listen to somebody that's successful, go. If you pick up one nugget, hey, you're that far ahead. If you didn't, you got some entertainment, right? You got to Amen. listen to somebody who's passionate about hunting. All right. So let's, uh, we're going to, when we come back for the rest of this, our next topic when we get back on this series is going to be spending time, investing your focus, time, energy, and money in elk hunting abilities. And we're going to talk about some of those. And some of them are going to be some things that you might not <laughs> think, guys, out there. So uh, that's one thing that, that we'll be doing when we get back. And hey, Joe, so, can, I, can I have a quick parenthesis if you don't mind? Uh -huh. I, I just, you know, for, especially for new listeners out there, most of our listeners understand the relationship we have. But right. I want people to understand how blessed I feel that I have you guys of my coaches. And when I say you guys, is inclusive of, of all of you, the four of you. You know, I, I have learned things from Joe, from Chaff, from Gilbert, from Manano. Yeah, believe it or not, from Manano as well. Uh, <laughs> so now you guys have all been incredible coaches. I feel truly blessed, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for the world. I mean, I think that my learning curve has been expedited because of you guys, and I just want to thank you guys for it because I, I love – my current experience as a hunter and i love that it was because of you guys so yeah. i just wanted to make that quick parenthesis i appreciate that man um so when we get down to our bros mailbox we got three questions down here we've already covered mike uh wilson's uh question uh, about the podcast so up next is going to be aaron t from mansfield texas and texas showing up in the house yep Manfield, Texas. Texas showing up in the house, man. Oh, uh, and I don't know if I told everybody or, or made that official announcement, but um, we are well over, well over 4,000 cities that uh, we have listeners in right now. Um, so we're awesome, at the 85,000 uh, downloads right now, uh, 56 countries, y'all. So it's so cool, man. It's just, uh, it's, it's, really cool to see how this is all going um his question was i've been putting in for new mexico for three years with no success aaron i got a lot of buddies crying that thing right now too <laughs> so uh do you have any tips on how to get drawn in your state i've put in for hard to draw units and i put in for easier units any advice is greatly appreciated i love to hunt new mexico and um, so as somebody who's been here for a while and, and we deal with this last year, Gilbert and, uh, and Brendan didn't draw last year. Uh, I, I wish you could, you know, here we had Manano and Luis who had drawn were on cloud nine. Me and Chav had drawn, we were on cloud nine and then we were waiting for the rest of the party and Gilbert's like, didn't draw. And I mean, draw. It was like first time in long time. It was funeral, man. It was like a yeah. funeral, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so he had to look at other options. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you. Let's let's talk about the drawing part first of all. And this is what I recommend to guys to do. And understand how the lottery works in New Mexico. There, if you're a a non-resident, there are two ways that you can apply in New Mexico for the draw. Okay, there's two ways. One way is uh, in the 6% pool, and one way is with an outfitter pool, okay? The, and I'll just tell you straight up, one way is only going to cost you what your application fee is, and the other way is going to cost you an outfitter's fee as far as you're going to have to pay for an outfitter. So it's it, it can be something where it's not exactly an outfitted hunt, uh, as far as food, as far as lodging, it could be something where you bring your own tent or something like that, but they must have a contract with you. They must have a guide with you for a minimum of two days, and uh, it, it's going to cost you more, And it's going, but it's going to put you in a little bit better pool if you do that. That's not feasible for a lot of guys. A lot of guys don't want to do that. Well, if you don't, <coughs> that's fine, um, there, because... If you don't draw, oh, let me go back. Let me take a step back. In the 6% pool, that's the pool that everybody's in, right? Um, what I recommend to guys to do is, and it's still a tough draw. We have one of our buddies that didn't draw for this hunt that's not going to be with us this year um, because it's a, it's just a tough draw. 6%, you know, if, if you have 100 tags in an area, that means six are going to whoever applies from out of state. 
right? So what I tell people is this, it doesn't matter if you um, apply for the hardest unit or the easiest unit in some ways. It matters when your number comes up. Uh, if your number comes up at the beginning of the lottery, you're gonna hit your first choice, even if it's a tough to draw area because uh, it's going to, just because of your placement. If you're way back on, your, on the lottery when your number gets drawn, it can get difficult to draw any area because of the number of people putting in for that 6%. But what I tell most guys out of state to do is this, is put in for the place that you want to go for your first choice. Whatever, I mean, wherever that ring is, that golden ring that you want to be able to draw, put it in for your first choice. And then for your next two choices, uh, what you want to do is you want to find those areas and, and we do this, we find those areas that people don't necessarily want to hunt th that have lower success rates. And, and let me tell you my opinion on success rates. I could care less about success rates. It doesn't mean anything to me because that just means that whoever was hunting last year had difficulty getting it done, right? Has nothing to do with who I am or what I'm going to do. So uh, I, I don't worry about success rates. I will pay attention to size of herd population. I will look at bull, cow, calf ratios. I'll look at those, but I don't worry about success rates. Um, so I would find those places that most guys are going to look at that and go, well, they don't have very much success and that there's more tags in that area because that increases that 6% for you. And I would do that for my second, my third choice. And uh, I'd put in for a, a region if there's any kind, if they allow, I, I'm not sure if they allow non-residents to put in for that region. Did you guys have that option for your fourth option out of state? Yes. Okay. I and so, so that that's an area that they figure if there's extra that they will give out, right? Okay. So that is an option too that can put you hunting in New Mexico. So you have the draw, you got the 6%. Um, you have the 10% pool, uh, but you're going to have to pay for an outfitter. You're going to have to do a contract and you're going to have to pay for a guide. Now, again, it might not be the same way as other things, but that's the way it can be done. Um, then your other choices are outside of the draw is landowner tags. And um, what that means is that in New Mexico, people that own certain amount of properties that deemed that they have uh, elk on that property will be determined by game and fish and they give them an appropriate amount of tags for their property, okay? Now, I will tell you this, most of those properties that have large properties are gonna have their tags as ranch only tags. That means you can only hunt on their property. And in order to do that, you're probably 90% gonna have to pay for uh, outfitter fees and a guide. Now there are some places that'll, that'll sell you a tag on their ranch DIY. So it gives you an opportunity. It's, you know, they're going to get their money for whatever they charge you for the tag. You're responsible for everything else, okay? Um, and then there's something that uh, we have people that own small amounts of property that used to be, it used to be called the E-plus program. And what that meant by that is, is that let's say that I'm a small property owner inside um, a, a unit, an elk hunting unit. And uh, I get two elk hunting tags and I only have 100 to 200 acres. Well, nobody's going to want to hunt on my 100, 200 acres. So what I do is I become a part of what, and I, I'm sorry, I couldn't remember the name for it right now. I just remember the E-plus program, which meant that I would allow hunters to have access through or on my property to hunt. And in turn, the tags that I receive are unit wide tags. So even though I have only 200 acres, that means that uh, other people that buy a tag from me can hunt on my property and the rest of the unit, okay? Because I am part of the program allowing my property to be used as trespass or hunting on it. So uh, there's a lot of these small places out there that are looking to get rid of tags that are trying to sell them. And, and those costs on those can vary depending on time of year and, and 
what people, uh, what the demand is, okay? Uh, if uh, a lot of these people don't want to end up eating them, so sometimes they'll, they'll give you a better price for it, okay? So th those are your options for hunting here in New Mexico. That's a, a little bit different. Um, I, the draw is tough. It's tough for rifle hunters. You guys putting in as rifle hunters, it's hard for an in-state rifle hunter to draw. It really is. That's a tough draw. Uh, so for yeah, an out-of-state, I mean, <clears throat> what's that? Uh, Ross, I talked to Ross Miller down there in uh, Fort Sumner, and his daughter didn't draw. Right. Yeah. And that, They didn't uh, draw at all. Yeah. And none yeah. of his guys drew. Right. So it has to be, you know, he's got state, state land or unit-wide and landowner tags, but that's it. All that's his it. guys didn't draw. Right. So trying to get in the regular draw was difficult. Uh, and that's a point. Man, he's an outfitter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. But an outfitter is not able to put themselves in an outfit. That's pool. correct. Right. That's so correct. so they're in that regular pool, just like mm -hmm. that. So uh, so th I hope that helps you out, Aaron. Um, next question from Ryan Foster. He's from Chatham, Ontario. He says, hi, guys. I really enjoy each and every one of your podcasts. They get me through my workouts and keep me in the gym just a little bit longer, especially when we start talking a lot, huh? What brand of calls, mouth reads, do you guys use, and how many do you carry with you on a hunt? Do you use different reads for bugling than you do for cow calling? I recently bought four different reads to try out, and I can't really make one do everything I need. Do I need to practice more? Any insight yeah. on this would be appreciated. And you guys want to throw something out before I jump on that? Yeah, for me, I use one. Uh, I don't like to be switching in the middle of my call sessions and stuff like that. So I find a call and look, sometimes I got to go through a couple of them because they just don't sound the way I want. Uh, I order multiples of them. Uh, sometimes the latex ain't stretched the same way on every call. Um, so I'm a big fan of the Primos Black call. I can do I can do any bugle I want with it and I can produce the small cow sounds with it. Uh, I, I have a smaller palate than most guys have, so I have to cut my call. Uh, but again, man, it's all about, for me, it's all about keeping it simple and not having to get too extravagant. Uh, I hunt with a guy that, man, he can pull five calls out of his bag and make them dance like, you know, uh, the best elk caller in the country. For me, I just, I don't want to get caught up in that. So I'll find something for me that works and that's what I go with. Kiss principle for you. That's right. right. I'm the, I'm the, I've been the same way the short time I've been at it. Um, I, I use the, but I use the Primo's white. That's mm -hmm. kind of the one that's worked for me. Um, I try the black one. I, I couldn't get it to sound the way I want it, but uh, it's the same thing, right? I mean, they, it seems like they stretch uh, a little bit after a while. And then, you know, when you get a new one in, it just, you have to work at it and just modify that little metal, plate the that's plate. above it and the pallet right. plate to 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 make it sound right so it takes a little bit of practice and play with it to get it to sound right yeah. and look i don't i don't have the best bugle i don't have the best cow call but i got you know decent uh of each and uh, that gets me through and for my where i'm at right now i think that works for for me chap what are you using i'm not sure the the brand but it says native on it it's a, oh, a so red. It's native by carlton yeah, Carlton, Car mm -hmm. and that seems to uh, great call. Uh, produce the call I want every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you another one, Joe, that I used was that amp call uh, that we got, and man, it's awesome. I I just can't get it to do the right bugles that I want it to do. Are so. you talking about the amp gray, or are you? Talking yeah, the gray. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, but the cow calls, it's money. Yeah. And, and uh, I know Chab, I think Chab's actually using more of a clover, like a clover type. It's one of them smaller, uh, yeah. you know, a little longer type uh, build on the on the reed like that. So he's kind of using that on the native by Carlton. And, and it, it uh, it's a little bit different look to it. Manana, which one did you get to start? Well, uh, uh, you can, you can, you can listen my, my calls. I use when I, when, when. Luis shot the an elk. I used my bare tongue to stop the bull uh -huh, before sure. it jumped the fence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can yeah. listen it when you edit when you uh, finish with the video. Uh, okay. Please, please, please edit edit the audio. Please edit the audio and take it out. It's embarrassing. But, uh... <laughs> that that clip alone after the shot, I'm going to tell you. I've seen 
you know, some of the best productions in my life. You know, we watch some of the same guys on TV. You will never see more raw emotion in your life than when he shoots that bull and Manano bear hugs him and they dogpile one another. It is amazing. It's what happens after the shot that's more awesome. impressive than the shot. It oh, was awesome. Pure, yeah. pure elation. Pure monkey off my back. Get down, high yeah. five. I mean, it is the stuff that dreams are made of, people. Yeah. Shaking like a leaf and crying totally like, epic. like a little boy, man. Yeah. So, Ryan, uh, I, I'll tell you this, man, that uh, when those guys were talking about the the primos black and white, that's because that's the, the call that was my go-to call for a lot of years. And the main reason it was is, again, for a lot of the stuff I got, my T-shirts, my gr my grunt tube, it was all at Walmart, man. And the, the thing about the Primos, that the reason I don't have a lot of guys, unless they're with me, that I can teach them how to tune them, is that they do take a lot of tuning. And you can buy five of them, and you can have two of them that just, they're going to sound like crap no matter what, and you might as well mm -hmm. toss it out. Uh, it, there's a lot of variance in that they're not that expensive there but what i like about them is they last a long time they i mean i've used a single primos two of them through Three an entire years. season and yeah. and and i guide a lot so uh, they're durable once tuned they're really go-to what i'll find is one that i've used for a while will end up being a good cow call and the ones like that you get new and that's what Luis is talking about some of the calls that you start to use don't sound that good at the beginning you got to really work them you got to throw some screams in to it you got to really make sure that you're getting them good and wet and uh and, and you just got to work it you got to get it break it in kind of so with that said i'll tell you this as well um i really like some of the native by carlton calls the the rip it red and those different ones like that are just and, and they have a little different makeup they've got the steel bar instead of the pallet plate and they you'll know which ones i'm talking about because Carlton's uh, native by Carlton calls are, are their art, their pieces of art, just the way they look. And but man, for bugling and stuff, I really, really like them because I can get some good raspy bull sounds and stuff out of it. Um, I don't really go to them that much for cow calling unless the cows are further away, close in. When I want to be softer, I want to go to something that I've already got broke in. I will also tell you this: the series you got the All Star, you got the Contender, you got the Champ. That's an orange, a white, and a green from uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Calls. Great call. That's the yeah. Elk 101 series. Those things right out of the box with their power plate have great sound to them. And I mean, especially doing cow calls. I have found that some of them when I start, and I'm not a tongue pressure guy. Uh, I'm more of a, a air volume guy to get my calls. So when I have things start to stretch on me, um, I, I kind of go, well, I, I kind of brings up a little light bulb for me, but some of those will actually start to to stretch on me a little bit when I start really working them. Now the Amp Gray by Phelps, and that's the only one I've tried so far. I was actually turned on to this by Freddie from Game Changer uh, uh, Calls. He sent me uh, a, a, a Gramp, uh, I'm sorry, an Amp Gray, and I have fallen in love with it. In fact, it's been my go-to turkey call this season as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, I really, I the durability has been good. Uh, the call levels a different thing has been good uh, for bugles and for cow calling. But again, I, I had to work that one just a little bit, but I thought it was really good out of the box. Those are the ones that I have used and that I'd like to use. And as we use more, I'll throw those out there as well. Okay. Yeah. I, I want to say again, I, I had the, uh, the, uh, the pleasure of meeting Will Primos at an event here in Houston at a at a uh, at one of our was Texas extract. Oh my gosh, they're such class people. Uh, yeah. Mr. Primos, a very you know well received, just a well rounded hunter and a Christian man that loves the outdoors and he loves people mm -hmm. and he loves God. And uh, I'm telling you, I couldn't meet a classier fella. He treated me like I was, you know, a king. I mean, really, never that's messed awesome. words with us. I mean, just good people, you know. Yeah. I, and I think that's the way most of them are. You know, you got to meet uh, Michael Waddell this year, and golly, they got more calls than you can. Look, check we're all stick just out. hunters, man. We're that's all just it. hunters. They're just good man. old boys. Yeah, just fellas like mm -hmm. to be out in the woods. And the last question comes from Felipe. 
Pettis from Miami, Florida. Um, he said, great episode on your podcast. I recently bought a diaphragm and started to practice. While uh, doing so, I started to think, if I'm hunting OTC yeah. public land, how likely am I to be calling other hunters in rather than bulls? Can you tell the difference? And uh, and w what I'll tell you, Felipe, is, is yeah, you're going to do that. And if you're doing that, then other people aren't telling the difference. Or they're from my crew who are told to go check it out no matter anyway. what. And uh, I, so what I tell you is if you really want to know and you want to locate those, that's where that night bugling or early morning bugling, when you're out there two, two hours before daylight, uh, you locate then, it's not going to be another hunter. So that's yeah. what you want to do there. Um, you can a lot of times tell it's another hunter by more, not so much of how it sounds, because elk can suck when they when they bugle. Especially they being up on right? the goat. Yeah. But it's, it's, gets broke. it's more where they're doing the same pattern, the same thing after, you know, one after the other. Or, uh, or they're doing a script. You can kind of tell when guys are starting to script things out. But uh, I, I, you know... Yeah, it can happen. And I want to go back to because on Ryan's, he had asked the question about he can't get one read to do everything. And do I need to practice more? And I'll tell you, Ryan, Ryan it's just the same thing that I, you heard from Lu Luis. You know, he had one that, you know, he could probably do a good bugle on, but not do a good cow call on it. Um, There's some of them that they have those, they have the, the, more stiff latex and so they're a little bit more difficult to get a good cow call on it uh, uh unless you know you're putting a little more pressure on it so it's not it's not necessarily that you need to practice more i think practicing more with one will help to vary it so that you can kind of go back and forth but me well, it could be I the fit reading. too joe it could be the fit up in that palette it, it could he may have to he may have to trim it around you know yep. Or, or also, sometimes when you put them in the palette, I don't know if you take it out, but you can see kind of like fold marks on the back of it. And that's where it's trying to fit in your palette. So it's crimping it together and it's letting a little bit of air. You can actually go and clip that out, like make a V on it, and it'll seal tighter on your mouth. Um, yep. and so that's a little tip there. But I change reads all the time. I carry four reads with me on a hunt. And... I, I change up all the time for a lot of different reasons. If I, you know, if I'm wanting to scream a certain rough bugle, I'll use one. I'll use my Carlton on there. If I'm trying to do something sweet, I might go to the contender on there. You know, I, I just kind of go back and forth. Or if I'm putting on a show, I will change reads just to sound like different animals out there. So uh, that that's, yeah, it, it's not always you that you're not able to do everything on the same one and once it comes out of the box you got to give them a little bit of break in period <laughs> do some screaming don't worry about what it sounds like just get after it break it in a little bit and then it might just fall right into that sweet spot okay all right guys that's it you for the you. night man Fellas, unbelievable. We can't thank everybody enough. Unbelievable content uh, this week. Going to turn into another series, it looks like, Joe. So yep. we're, we're happy for that. Guys, if you like what we're doing, please subscribe, yep. rate, and review. You go to Apple Podcasts or iTunes to review us, and uh, those five-star reviews are well-received. And you can check out more elk hunting content at elkbros.com. And please, guys, if you need to send us an email, we'll get it here on the show. And you can do that at info at elkbros.com. That's info at elkbros.com. Absolutely, Fellas, man. It was epic having the true tandem <laughs> Venezuelan <Thank> mafia you. <laughs> guys. The jefe from the north Thank and the you. one from the south down here. <laughs> Epic to have our buddy from the north out of the D town up in Big D, Dallas, Texas. And Manano got their own. Uh, we're so happy for you, brother. Congratulations. Oh, congratulations God bless man. you. Congratulations. To see the new, uh, Thank the you new all. rascal. Uh, I, I guess uh, we'll be uh, knowing what's going on here in the next eight to nine months for sure. Uh, Chab, yes, so cool to have you on the podcast again with us. Luis, as, as always, man, we can't thank our guys from New Mexico enough, Joe and Chav. It's been a blast. And like I say, after every podcast, we got to practice this social distancing, people. So <clears throat> please fist bump your wives, wives fist bump your husbands, uh, high five your kids, and keep your broad <laughs> head sharp and your powder dry. And we'll see you next week right here on Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Thank you, guys. Peace. 
Peace, peace, y'all. Peace.